situation. Irish loyalists rise up in arms against English rule. Mission, invade Ireland and suppress the Irish uprising. Execution, use cavalry, infantry, and heavy artillery commencing 1649. Administration, the British New Model Army. Command and control, Oliver Cromwell. Welcome to Conquerors. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Like a hidden reef that can mean disaster for a sailing ship, the country of Ireland has often ruined the plans of potential conquerors. However, in the 17th century, one English commander was able to lead his troops to victory in the Emerald Isle. His name was Oliver Cromwell. While he gained fame as a cavalry commander during the English Civil Wars, Cromwell's primary weapon in Ireland was the cannonball because his enemies tended to disappear behind medieval walls rather than challenge him to combat in open terrain. Now, Cromwell was only in Ireland for less than 40 weeks, but his bloody, brutal campaign cast a long and ugly shadow. Lay on, lay on, lay on, lay on. He wreaked such death and destruction throughout the island that his name to this day has become synonymous with a curse in Ireland. May the curse of Cromwell be upon you. Whenever you travel around Ireland, anywhere you see a ruined castle or a ruined house, and you ask locals who was responsible, they always say, oh, it was Cromwell. Even though Cromwell might never have been there, and it probably was destroyed 200 years after his death. The story begins in October of 1641, as Catholics in the Emerald Isle conspired to throw off English Protestant rule. Ireland had been under the heel of the British crown for centuries, but in the early 1600s, the crown instituted a plantation policy that seized land from native Irish Catholics and gave it to English settlers. Quite understandably. Uh, the Irish felt that these English had come in, stolen their land, and they wanted to kick them out. What we have initially is a revolt by the Ulster native Irish against the Protestant settlement. They also tried to seize the city of Dublin, uh, a plan which fails. But this initial revolt in the north of the island very quickly spreads throughout uh, the entire island uh, by 1642. There was brutality on both sides, and it's estimated that more than 4,000 Englishmen died in the Irish uprising, with a similar number of Irish killed. As tales of the revolt filtered to England, 4,000 dead became 154,000. Protestant propaganda blamed Catholic rebels for the atrocities. Lurid stories of the excesses of the Irish Catholics, uh, slaughtering people in their beds, uh, using pikes to kill children, driving women into rivers where they drowned, uh, were used to whip up uh, anti-Catholic and anti-Irish hysteria in England, and very successfully. Englishmen were already prone to view the Irish as savages, so these exaggerated tales fell on willing ears, including those of Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell was a member of Parliament from Cambridge and a fundamentalist Protestant. Cromwell was not only a Puritan, but he came from the more radical branch of Puritanism. He was a separatist or independent. They thought the Church of England was too far gone to purify. They wanted a separate, independent church. These were the radicals within a radical group. Cromwell himself showed few signs of future greatness. He doesn't give the impression of being a gentleman. He gives the impression of being just down from the farm in, in many senses, uncouth, I think. He was an ordinary sort of fellow. Uh, in fact, the only distinguishing mark he had was a big wart, just here. And there's one occasion when a guy was painting his portrait, and the painter said to him, do you want me to include the wart? And he said, yeah, uh, paint me warts and all. With Cromwell, what you saw is what you got. 
The Irish uprising caused a great political crisis in England when the king and parliament disagreed over who should raise an army to quell the Irish. This blew up into an all-out confrontation. The entire kingdom was coming apart at the scene. Within a year, a civil war broke out between royalist supporters of Charles I and radical members of parliament who opposed the king, including Cromwell. He personally raised a parliamentary cavalry troop to fight the king. Cromwell was 43 years old when the Civil War began and had no military training or experience, and yet he was an instant success, rising to become a lieutenant general. He was just one of those extraordinarily gifted amateurs. He never went to the West Point because they didn't have West Points at the time. But if you look at great generals like a Patton or an Eisenhower or even a Montgomery, these people are not taught they are great generals because of what's inside them. And Cromwell had that leadership. With the ordnance, the entire body, there to the enemy's left. Cromwell brought a peculiar intensity to the field. He could become so filled with nervous energy that he would bite down on his lower lip hard enough to draw blood. The early battles of the Civil War provided a crash course in 17th century cavalry tactics for the inexperienced commander. The standard technique was to keep the horses close together and charge full speed at the enemy. After impact, the horsemen dispersed to chase individual targets, but Cromwell made his cavalry more efficient by training them to keep together after a charge and then circle around and continue the attack rejects many of the old-fashioned ideas of what a cavalry generalship is and he learns to use mass and weight in cavalry to charge through or crush the opposition. We're all familiar with the literary image of a knight in a full suit of shining armor but by Cromwell's era that kit had been reduced to something that weighed only about 25 pounds. It included a breastplate, a backplate and a helmet. Now, a cavalryman like this one would normally carry a brace of flintlock pistols like this. But his most potent weapon was a three-foot double-edged sword. Now, from horseback, a weapon like this is devastating to infantry on the ground. Not only was he a masterful cavalry commander, but some consider Cromwell to be the father of the British Army. Between 1645 and 1646, he participated in the creation of the first professional standing army in British history, replacing the loosely organized militias in each county with a centralized command structure. This force, known as the New Model Army, was the one Cromwell would use in his conquest of Ireland. Because of their standard issue red uniforms, these were the first British troops that could rightfully call themselves Redcoats. The well-trained, well-armed, and well-dressed Redcoats turned the tide of the English Civil War. By spring 1646, the King's Royalist forces were crushed. Charles I surrendered, and in 1649, he would lose his crown and his head. It was Cromwell who decided on putting the king on trial and chopping his head off. And that was the most incredible uh, event of the middle of the 17th century. It was one of those events that everyone who was alive at the time remembered exactly what they were doing when they heard the news. Although Charles I was dead, there was still a strong royalist presence in Ireland. This Irish resistance had to be crushed. It didn't require much convincing to get Oliver Cromwell to lead an invasion. He was eager to get revenge on the Irish. Cromwell's mindset, I think, was that the situation had become sufficiently settled in England with the uh, execution of the king that it was finally possible to do something that they would have preferred to have done back in 1641. Uh, and now that the opportunity was there, he seized it with both hands. Oliver Cromwell's personal philosophy of war was simple. Find the enemy army, engage them head on, and destroy them on the fields of battle. 
It was the impatient strategy of an impatient man. It was a very hard-hitting, rapid style. If it took a forced march of uh, 40 miles at night to be in position to launch a surprise attack, uh, he would do it. Cromwell prepared well for his Irish campaign, ensuring that there would be enough money and supplies flowing from England for the duration of the fight. He also did his homework. Know your enemy. It's crucial for any military commander. And it's as important today as it was in the 17th century. If Cromwell was going to destroy the Irish resistance, he first had to know who he was fighting. Irish opposition to Cromwell had united behind Royalist commander James Butler, the Marquis of Ormond. It was an uneasy collection of Irish Catholics and Protestant Royalists called the Confederate Royalist Alliance. Ormond had been the King's Lord Lieutenant in Ireland and was committed to seeing the monarchy restored. Sensing his army was no match for Cromwell's invading force, he adopted a defensive strategy. But when Cromwell arrives, he's facing a very different type of war. I think he expected to be fighting big battles out in the field. What he actually ends up fighting is a number of uh, isolated sieges as the Confederate Royalist Alliance retreats back into their strongholds and waits for Cromwell to attack them. And attack them he did. In the coming months, Cromwell's massive war machine would roll across Ireland, leaving not just walls, Countless lives shattered in its wake. In August 1649, Oliver Cromwell's conquering war machine arrived from England near the city of Dublin, Ireland. No storm clouds could have been more ominous. In total, Cromwell brought 12,000 soldiers from his new model army to wage the Irish campaign. They were comprised of roughly 4,000 cavalry and 8,000 infantry. A full two-thirds of Oliver Cromwell's new model army was composed of musketeers like this agent. Their primary armament was this weapon, a matchlock. Now, like all muzzle-loading weapons, you put powder and ball in here, ram it home. But there was a difference. This weapon required you to carry a burning match or fuse throughout the course of the battle, difficult in and of itself. To fire it, to launch all of that powder and get the round down range, you were required to prime the pan by placing a small amount of powder in that pan. Close the pan, then load your match into this device, which is called a serpent or the lock, hence match lock. Imagine all of this while the enemy is charging at you. Now, the match lock was so long and cumbersome that musketeers frequently had to use an aiming or support stick like this one in order to get any sort of accuracy at all with the weapon. Now, you take a look got a target, open the pan, aim down range, and hope for the best. Someone cynically suggested probably about as many people were killed by being hit over the head with the barrel of a musket than were actually killed by the bullets that muskets fired. The remaining third of Cromwell's new model army was composed of pikemen. Now, these were generally tall and beefy guys, and the reason is they had to handle something like this, an 18-foot spear or pike. They often cut it down in combat so that it'd be more handy in close quarters. Now, pikemen were generally employed in the middle of an infantry formation, and their primary job was to form a screen for those musketeers against cavalry attack. For that reason, they wore armor and a helmet, like this, called a pot then and now. The idea was that that armor would provide protection against musket balls and sword strikes. Cromwell's battle plan in Ireland called for securing the ports along the eastern and southeastern coastline. Once secure, he could move inland toward the capital of the resistance movement located at Kilkenny. 
For his opening attack, Cromwell decided to take out the royalist stronghold at Drogheda, 25 miles north of Dublin. Taking the strategically located town would help to secure Dublin and Cromwell's northern flank. Rochida was well defended. The town was encircled by a wall 20 feet high and 6 feet thick at its base. To defend Rochida, there were 300 cavalry and more than 2,000 infantry. To open the attack on Drogheda, Cromwell placed his batteries south of town, one to the east of St. Mary's Church, the other on this high ground that today is known as Cromwell's Mount. It took two weeks for Cromwell to set up the enormous gun batteries, the largest of which, the Cannon of Eight, fired a shot weighing more than 60 pounds. There are very few modern defences in the 17th century in Ireland at this time. Many of the towns and cities, and Drogheda would have been a perfect example of this, have simple medieval curtain walls. They're very high, but they're not that deep. And what they're actually designed to defend against are people who are trying to scale the walls, be it through ladders or whatever way, trying to get over the walls. What they're not built to defend against is artillery. And fire! As Cromwell's artillery opened on Drogheda's medieval walls, his regimental commanders prepared for the storm. In a military tradition of the day, they drew lots to see which regiments would lead the charge. The unlucky winners were known as the Forlorn Hope. His plan was to open two breaches in Drogheda's walls. Now, breaches tend to funnel an attacker into killing zones. Multiple breaches, or two entry points, force the defender to divide his effort, and they give the attacking force more opportunity to exploit the breach. By early evening, 11 September 1649, Cromwell's cannons had opened two breaches in the castle wall. Then Cromwell gave the order to charge. Amid hymn singing and war cries, a forlorn hope surged toward the wall. If you had been a soldier assaulting the breach in the wall at Drogheda, it would have been absolutely terrifying. As terrifying if you'd been, say, a, a GI landing uh, on D-Day, low. Chances of surviving were very low. You knew that. Brutal, bloody and nasty warfare. Because those at the back can see what's going to happen to them. Those in the middle are stuck and they can't do anything about it. Those at the front are fighting for their lives. You had to climb over not just walls which had fallen down and stones, but dead bodies all over the place to get through this narrow gap. Cromwell watched from the rear, furious as the first assault was repulsed. When a second assault failed to penetrate the town, he'd seen enough. Cromwell, after seeing that his men were now wavering, led the third assault himself right into the breach in the wall. put his money where his mouth was, you might say. He wasn't an officer who hung back and told other people to go take the risks. Cromwell threw most of his reserve, some 8,000 troops at the breach. As corpses piled up at the wall, Cromwell became filled with rage. The restraints, which he's, he has in everyday life, as everybody does, seem to disappear, and he becomes almost uh, mad with battle. Cromwell's anger fueled his men, and now it was fueling him. At last, his soldiers successfully swarmed through the town, and he let his tightly disciplined force off the leash. There was a long tradition that if you survive the breach, you are allowed to plunder, to rape, 
to loot, to kill, to murder the enemy and civilians on the other side. Now that tradition had a purpose because what you were saying to the defenders is if we have to go through that breach, if we have to take terrible casualties, you are going to pay a price and a terrible price. Now, if you surrender now, we'll let everyone march out. You can take your women and children. But if you make us go through that breach, we are going to get our revenge. In the hours that followed, Cromwell's troops carried out a massacre here within the walls of Drogheda. It's been the subject of controversy ever since. Many of the town's defenders were killed right here on Mill Mount where they'd retreated. Some parliamentary officers offered quarter, but Cromwell himself rode up and said, take no prisoners. In most circumstances, the honorable way of dealing with them would be to take them prisoner. Uh, but Cromwell chose the, the harsh line here, though some would say he was, as I say, within the accepted rules of war at the time. Around a hundred Irish soldiers retreated to the steeple and roofs of St. Peter's Church. Cromwell personally ordered the pews to be piled like firewood and set aflame. The Irish soldiers were burned alive. In total, somewhere between two and four thousand people died within the walls of Drogheda. There's no doubt that what happened was a massacre. Cromwell lost control. He lost control of himself and of his army, which, at the end of the day, is, is not what a general's supposed to do. Cromwell can certainly be faulted for succumbing to the bloodlust of the moment and losing his self-control, but he also thought the shock and awe of Drogheda might shorten the war by showing the Irish that resistance was futile. They've been called the kings of battle and the dogs of war. Something you never forget if you've been to war is the frightening sound of the artillery as they blast out their deadly cannonade. For most of the Irish people, Oliver Cromwell's assault in 1649 would have been their first exposure to big guns. There wasn't much noise in the 17th century. There were no boom boxes. There was no ubiquitous television. And therefore, when you have the noise of artillery going off, it must have found, sounded terrifying. Artillery was critical to Cromwell's success in Ireland, but it also presented logistical problems. With each gun weighing several tons, moving artillery from battle to battle could be a major drag on the pace of a conquering army. Taking this into account, Cromwell wisely decided to move his artillery train by ship when he deployed his army south from Drogheda to his next target. Wexford. Wexford was a walled town located within a harbor at the mouth of the River Slaney. Entry to the harbor was guarded by Roslare Fort, which Cromwell's cavalry commander took with little resistance. To the southeast of town, on high ground just outside the walls, stood Wexford Castle. By the time Cromwell's army arrived at Wexford's walls, the Irish weather had whipped up a cold, windy storm, turning his encampment into a quagmire and preventing his guns from being offloaded in the harbor. With winter fast approaching, Wexford would make ideal quarters for his ailing troops. So Cromwell would need a repeat of Rochida, a swift campaign using artillery to breach the walls in a fierce assault to seize the town. By now, of course, the, the inhabitants of Wexford have heard about Drogheda and don't want to have that experience. The governor of the town was under pressure from the townspeople to surrender, but he was waiting to see if the royalist general Ormond would deliver reinforcements. The governor tried to stall Cromwell through negotiation. But Cromwell preferred to let his artillery do the talking. 
When the weather allowed, he began to offload his big guns and then place them here on this piece of high ground south of town, known today as Tree Span Rock. His first target, Wexford Castle. On the same day, Ormond arrived with reinforcements. Ormond himself stayed outside the town to watch the proceedings from the north bank of the river. His heart must have sunk as Cromwell's gunners opened up with eight cannons and two mortars, firing 100 shots in all. Unlike traditional cannon, which fired a solid shot at a relatively flat trajectory, mortars, like this one, fired a hollow shot at a relatively high trajectory. The idea was to lob a projectile beyond enemy fortifications or into the center of an enemy formation. Now, this is a relatively small mortar, but Cromwell's gunners had mortars like this that could fire projectiles of up to 500 pounds, and they fired several types of shells. Some were for use against fortifications, some were anti-personnel. Now, the shell that a mortar fires is not solid at all. In fact, it's hollow and filled with gunpowder. It's detonated by a separate fuse, the idea being to make sure that the projectile detonates when it's on the target and not before. Now, Cromwell's gunners took to calling these shells grenados, but the Irish referred to them as bombs, which is the first use of what's now become a relatively common word. Again, medieval Irish stone proved no match for modern English lead. By noon, several breaches had been made in the castle walls. Once again, the town governor opened negotiations with Cromwell for a ceasefire. While this was happening, the commander in charge of Wexford Castle opened his gates and turned over the keys to Cromwell's men. Chaos ensued. Another route was on. This takes place while Cromwell is in negotiations with the leaders of Wexford for the surrender of the town. Cromwell knows nothing of this, and therefore the attack on Wexford takes place, if you like, almost without his knowledge. This market area is known as the Bull Ring. It was here in 1649 that the defenders of Wexford were slaughtered. There was no stopping the Cromwellian onslaught. So again, we have the killing not only of the entire garrison, but also of civilians, as happened at Drogheda. His only comment on this after it's taken place again is that this is the righteous judgment of God on these barbarous wretches uh, for their behavior during the 1640s. Cromwell's army left the town too ruined to serve as winter quarters. So they had to march on. It became clear that no Irish army would challenge Cromwell in the field. He'd been forced into siege warfare. Cromwell had little experience with sieges and his explosive personality was hardly suited to a siege mentality. He is, in many senses, an exceptional cavalry commander and, in some senses, an exceptional commander. But in terms of that art of siege warfare, he is often uh, bullheaded and irresponsible. Cromwell's next major target was Waterford. It was Ireland's second largest city at the time and located on the river shore. Cromwell wanted to sail his ships right up to the town and unload his artillery. But to do so, he'd have to pass a formidable fortification at Duncannon, which guarded the mouth of the river. To take Waterford, he'd have to attack that fort. Unlike the medieval walls at Drogheda and Wexford, Duncannon was one of Ireland's first modern fortifications. It was built in 1588 to defend against the Spanish Armada. Its angled walls provided a much better defense against incoming artillery shells than traditional flat walls. It also gave the defenders a better platform for firing their cannons against a besieging force. 
Even if Cromwell's men somehow survived the artillery fire and made it through the outer walls of the fort, they still had to contend with a deep, dry moat, which would surely turn into a graveyard for them. Further complicating Cromwell's plans, there was no safe port near Duncannon to land and unload his heavy siege cannons. That left him with only his small field guns for the siege. Cromwell's small guns were no match for the angled walls of Duncannon. True to its design, the fort could not be penetrated. At that point, Cromwell's tactical ineptness as a siege commander starts to come into to play. This tactical bullishness is, when met with resistance, not the only way forward, and, and he can't think of, think of a, another solution. That's, that's all he's got in his locker, as it were. Unable to make any progress, a frustrated Cromwell was forced to call off the siege of Duncannon. Cromwell's prospects of taking Waterford were now in question. The mark of a great general is his ability to innovate, adapt, and overcome. If Oliver Cromwell still hoped to conquer Ireland, he'd have to do just that. In November of 1649, Oliver Cromwell was very much a man in trouble. He'd come to Ireland in search of one large, decisive battle. The enemy wouldn't give it to him. What was supposed to be a quick, conquering campaign was dragging on. Through attrition, his 12,000-man field army had been reduced to only 3,000. He's losing men, uh, not necessarily from combat, but from um, disease. Ireland is a, is a place in the 17th century that punishes large armies, and small armies can't survive. Uh, dysentery, uh, other diseases sweep through the ranks very early on in the campaign. Frustrated by his failed effort to capture the fort at Duncannon, Cromwell's plan to seize Waterford by sea had to be completely retooled. Instead of moving troops and supplies up the river from the south, he would have to bring them over land from the north. Only one enemy could stop Cromwell's advance now, and that was the Irish weather. Heavy rains came, which made moving troops difficult and rolling in heavy siege guns nearly impossible. By 2 December 1649, Cromwell realized that a siege of Waterford under these conditions would be unwise. With that, Cromwell withdrew his forces and gave up his campaign to attack and take Waterford. The new model army retired to winter quarters in garrisons stretching throughout the southwest of Ireland where Cromwell had been employing politics rather than ballistics to convince a series of towns to surrender. At the same time, members of Parliament were writing to Cromwell with increasingly desperate pleas. The son of King Charles had gone to Scotland where he planned a renewed offensive to restore the monarchy. With the new British government in danger, Cromwell was asked to come home and save the day. The pressure on him to go back to England to start to resolve the, the, the conflict which is blowing up between England and Scotland is, is intense at this point. With this new sense of urgency and a break in the Irish weather, Cromwell delayed his return to England in order to put his war machine back on the march at the end of January. Waterford had proved too difficult to capture, so Cromwell set his sights on Kilkenny, the seat of power for General Ormond and the center of the Irish resistance. Now, Cromwell began the most complicated maneuvering of his Irish campaign. He split his forces into two main columns, forming a huge pincer. With that, Cromwell crushed all resistance in his path and converged around Kilkenny in late March. Victory at Kilkenny would require seizing both the town and Kilkenny Castle, 
which had the added significance of being General Ormond's home. The castle stood on high ground overlooking the River Nore. A wall connected to the castle spread out to surround the adjacent town. Cromwell's first move was to send a detachment of redcoats to set up a cannon battery outside the south wall. They opened a breach. Charge! Cromwell then ordered his infantry to assault. And Cromwell kept up the pressure for several days, sending more infantry assaults into town and blasting a second breach into the walls. On 27 March, the governor of Kilkenny finally surrendered both the town and the castle. While the surrender of Kilkenny was an important victory for Cromwell, the Irish were not yet conquered. A fierce pocket of resistance existed in the nearby town of Clonmel. For his final battle in Ireland, he would attack them. In late April 1650, Oliver Cromwell's rejuvenated army of 8,000 soldiers and 600 cavalry arrived at the walls of Clonmel on the banks of the River Shore. The name Clonmel, it seemed, would now be added to the bloody toll begun at Drogheda seven months before. But the citizens of Clonmel had reason to take heart. In command of their garrison was Hugh Duff O'Neill, an experienced warrior and resistance leader. He had 2,000 men under his command, mostly Irish Catholic troops from Ulster. The most disciplined, the, the most successful, the most experienced troops that the Irish had were these Ulster Irish uh, forces. Hugh Duff is one of the few commanders that seems to be able to take on Cromwell and seems to be confident in taking him on. Cromwell had little choice about where to place his heavy guns, the biggest of which weighed 8,000 pounds. With a river to the south and marshy terrain to the east and west, the only ground that could support these monsters was to the north. Because of this, Cromwell wouldn't be able to use his favorite tactic of creating two simultaneous breaches. This didn't worry Cromwell, although it should have, since it meant that O'Neill could focus his defense on one killing zone instead of two. It took nearly a day for Cromwell's guns to breach the walls. The plan was to send the infantry in first. Once they were in, they'd swing around and open one of the town's gates for the waiting cavalry. Cromwell ordered the charge and personally joined his cavalry at the gate. He had no idea that O'Neill had prepared a nasty surprise. Now, here's Cromwell's tips for conquerors. Be brutal and violent in your opening attack to instill fear and demoralize your enemy. Outman and outgun your enemy. Use heavy artillery wherever possible. Secure unbreakable supply lines. They are your lifeline. In the spring of 1650, Oliver Cromwell's redcoats began their defiant charge into the town of Clonmel, the latest target on their campaign to conquer Ireland. Intoning hymns and psalms as they charged, they poured through the breach, God's army storming its way to yet another victory. But the Irish commander of the garrison, Hugh O'Neill, had other ideas. He had laid a trap. Behind the city walls, he'd constructed two walls perpendicular to the breach and one parallel to it, forming a pen. Atop the walls, O'Neill placed his artillery and men. Once Cromwell's men charged through the killing zone, the Irish were able to fire down on them like shooting fish in a barrel. The guys following into the breach didn't know that their, their colleagues were trapped inside the wall, so they kept on pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. O'Neill had built the walls of his trap with firing steps, allowing musketeers to fire, then duck down and reload while another man stepped up to discharge his shot. Other musketeers fired down from the windows of surrounding houses. Death came in many ways to Cromwell's soldiers who were caught in O'Neill's trap. Some were stabbed with pikes or slashed with scythes. 
Others were crushed by timber blocks hurled by an improvised catapult. Still others were mutilated by cannons firing chain shot. This is what's known as chain shot. It's essentially two cannonballs joined by a length of chain. When this was fired, it would spin through the air and cut a bloody path through an enemy formation. Even if the chain broke, which it often did under the impact of firing, it simply turned the cannon into the ultimate shotgun. It may be that war is hell is the ultimate cliche, but the fighting in the breach at Clonmel sure came close. When the town gates didn't open quickly, Cromwell sensed that something was going wrong with the assault. He rode over to the breach to see for himself and was furious to see his men retreating from the wall. Cromwell urged his infantry to fight on, but for the first time, his charisma had no effect on his troops. So he ordered his cavalry to dismount and sent them into the breach. Russell's charge! Yeah! Julius just has one tactic, which is to blast the walls and charge in. Now that works successfully at Drogheda and to some degree at Wexford as well. Uh, at Clonmel, it goes disastrously wrong uh, and Cromwell really doesn't have a plan B. Fighting continued inside the walls for three hours before Cromwell was forced to admit defeat and call off his assault. Somewhere between 1,000 and 2,500 parliamentary soldiers died in that assault, around a tenth of Cromwell's army. Many of his senior officers lay dead. The resistance that was put up by Hugh Dub O'Neill was very effective and cost Cromwell a great many men uh, and, and really gave him a bloody nose. I mean, uh, even great generals had bad days at the office. Uh, and Cromwell was no exception. He, he didn't bat a thousand, and nobody does. Surprisingly, the following day, the mayor of Clonmel surrendered the town to Cromwell. But when Cromwell marched through the gates, he discovered that Duff O'Neill had outwitted him again. Low on ammunition and supplies, the cunning Irish commander had moved his force out of town under cover of darkness. In the end, Cromwell had succeeded in taking the town, but the siege of Clonmel remains a blight on his record. After Clonmel, Cromwell finally gave in to the mounting pressure to return to England. He departed Ireland on 26 May 1650 to prepare for war against a royalist invasion force in Scotland. He left the Irish campaign in the hands of his son-in-law, Henry Ireton. Under Ireton's command, the Redcoats were finally able to take the town of Waterford. It took more than two years, but town by town, Oliver Cromwell's new model army eventually conquered the entire Emerald Isle. Military victory didn't spell the end of Cromwell's intervention in Ireland. After the war ended, he set in motion what became known as the Cromwellian Settlement. It was a plan that saw the land of 3,000 Catholics seized and turned over to English Protestants. This left a legacy of bitterness for hundreds of years. That bitterness and dispossession has made it impossible to establish good relations between Ireland and, and England. And that legacy is with us, at least to a degree, to this day. After conquering the Irish and defeating the Scots, Cromwell put away his sword and went back to politics. In 1653, he dissolved Parliament and took personal control of Britain as its Lord Protector. After his death in 1658, the monarchy was quickly restored, and public sentiment turned so against Cromwell that his body was exhumed, hanged for public display, and then beheaded. To the Irish, that must have seemed like ultimate justice. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Thanks for watching Conquerors.